Hello, 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 everyone. Welcome. It is Thursday, May the 16th, 2019. I'm in Kennewick, Washington. Be here for one more day, and then I'll be leaving tomorrow, headed to Portland, Oregon, to do some ministry there this weekend, Saturday and Sunday. So welcome to uh, Kennewick, Washington. They call themselves the Tri-Cities because there's Richland and Pasco, Washington here as well. So welcome to Trina, welcome to Michelle, welcome to Joanne. Hello, 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 everybody. Uh, da, 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 I think, yes, I've shared it with some of my groups. Uh, so today I'm talking about a topic that um, I've talked about in the past, but at a high level. I'm going to go deeper today uh, because the Holy Spirit's directed me to. And we're talking about what are the costs of being a Freemason. And I can speak to this because I didn't know this when I grew up, but my grandfather, so on my father's side, my dad's dad, he was a Freemason. And we did not know it, at least I did not know it, until my grandfather passed away. And I remember when he used to walk, he used to have bowed legs and pains in his back. And he was not the most, I don't know, jovial, fun-loving uh, man in the world. He was, I did a lot of work for him. He had a farm um, that uh, he had, 300-acre farm. So we bailed hay and did a lot of stuff. And so I didn't really realize that he was even a Freemason until... I know when he had passed away, um, there were some guys with some funny aprons that came up and then my family all walked away when they were doing their ceremony at the end. And it didn't click to me until after I, I wrote my book, Restored to Freedom, where I started to put some connections together with some of the bad things that came out of Freemasons that affected people that came into getting prayed for with back pain and neck pain and various curses on them that I started to put a connection between that and I remember when uh, my brother was reading the book Restored to Freedom he said you know the grandpa was a Freemason and I'm like no really he's like yeah he was I'm like oh my gosh so um, I did a little more research on Freemasons actually was given this book by a friend named Ashley down in San Antonio the Question of Freemasonry and the Founding Fathers by David Barton. It's a really good, short, quick read. Answers the questions about, you know, how many of the Founding Fathers of America were Freemasons? You know, is Freemasonry compatible with Christianity? Did the Founders embed Masonic symbols in Washington, D.C. and in our currency? Was George Washington a Freemason and a Christian? And is free American Freemasonry the same today as it was 200 years ago? So I read that and got a little more understanding of everything. And uh, oh, let me see if I can, the light keeps coming in. I'll make it a little darker on my, well, it's still. Hmm. There we go. Do it this way. Ba, 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 ba. Alrighty. So, um, I did some more research on it, and then when the Lord started having me go around the country to do deliverances, then um, I remember, I'll never forget this, I went to a, a well, there's two different instances that happened, and I was always suspecting at some point that there might be a Freemason in the audience that might take an offense at what I'm saying. When I try to explain to people, I'm just trying to help you, you know, get set free, get delivered, get healed, and all this stuff and uh, looking for all the open doors that the enemy can have to hurt a person so that we can take those away and get delivered. So I remember I was invited to come to a school in Western New York and uh, it was out in the middle of nowhere, small town. And uh, this um, guy actually bought the school that he used to go to in elementary. And he bought it and he actually lives there, which is kind of cool. <laughs> you know. He could, play basketball anytime he wants. Got the whole full court there. So I remember I was shooting baskets before I was getting ready to start. Well, then I went through explaining, went through the deliverance. I talked, you know, briefly about Freemasons. And then at the end, this guy came up to me and he had like one eye missing and he talked really hard to hear him in his throat. And then he explained to me when he was talking that he had cancer. 
And uh, I was like, okay. And he's like, hey, he goes, I don't, I don't remember seeing anything about what you were talking about Masons being bad. And I'm like, okay. My first question was, how long were you in it? Because it's a progression. You know, they don't spring on you the 33rd degree in the first year, because if they did, you would have nothing to do with it. It's a slow progression. You know, they start out being nicey nice to you and having you go through some uh, more minor uh, oaths until you get into it for a while. And so he admitted he'd only been there for a couple of years. I'm like, okay, then you probably did not see everything that went on if you had stayed until whatever, 20 years or 30 years or the 33rd degree and all that stuff. And he did have to admit that it was about money. And I'm like, yep, that's what it's about. It's all about money. And uh, so that was the first person that actually addressed that with me. And he did it in a private conversation. It was, you know, it was uh, preparing me <laughs> for the next public um, situation. And that was in Ironton, Ohio, where the mayor of Ironton, um, a lady invited me to come there to speak at an open market area called the Farmer's Market, which was in downtown Ironton. She knew about Jezebel. She'd just taken over as mayor, um, and she knew about Jezebel. She did not know anything about Leviathan, so I explained to her about Leviathan and, you know, Freemasons and stuff. And so, um, as I'm going through my spiel, and everybody's listening, then the Holy Spirit reminds me, you didn't talk about Freemasons, because I was getting ready to go through the deliverance prayers at the end. And so, when I talked about Freemasons, then there was a man at the very back that got very upset and was like, hey, what are you going to get your missions? It's like, uh-oh. <laughs> you know, and he starts to like walk towards me and his wife's with him. They're like getting ready to kill me. And I'm like, okay, Lord, now what do I do? He's like, oh, just take authority. I'm like, oh, okay. So acting like I'd been there before, <laughs> I just take authority. I raise my voice a little bit and just say, okay, let's, let's all pray. <laughs> so I took authority. I shut down all enemy um, junk in Jesus' name, and then he stopped from coming forward about halfway back, right behind my camera, my phone, and uh, he was like, as his hand was like paused against a steel pole, and then I went through the prayers with everybody. Of course, he didn't go through them, nor did his wife, and then um, the Lord said, now prophesy over all of them. That'll buy you more time. I'm like, seriously? So I prophesied over all, whatever, 50 of them, and he was the last one. And when I called him out to prophesy, he was like, hey, what are you? and then his wife's like, shh, quiet, he's going to prophesy over you. I'm like, hey, yay, wife. And so I did, and when I gave him a word from the Lord, he shut up, he didn't say anything. And he even helped us put away things at the end. And I was like, oh my gosh. Obviously, I didn't have to be too, too smart to realize he was a Freemason. <laughs> and so the uh, pastor came up to me and said, oh, Nelson, just want to let you know, uh, he was a Freemason and uh, he just became a Christian like four weeks ago. I'm like, oh, well then that explains his vehement anger. <laughs> he's like, yes. And so I'm like, wow, I'm glad that I'm still alive. <laughs> so then I moved on down the road after that. So that, that was my... Uh, <laughs> my concern because I understand just like Jesus, when Jesus would speak things that the, the evil Pharisees, not all the Pharisees were evil, but those that were, had the evil hearts that hated him, they would be upset with him. They would want to kill him. And so we have to understand when people have given their lives over to demonic things, then the demonic spirits will manifest in them if you're speaking truth that the demons don't want to hear. So all that being said, what are the costs of being a Freemason? I'm going to read from a couple things. I'm going to read from this book again, David Barton, uh, The uh, Question of Freemasonry and the Founding Fathers. So I highlighted some things that I have actually put into my own notes when I do my deliverances around the country. And these are the highlights of the book. Um, he talks about Scottish Rite um, Shriners, uh, just F FYI, to become a Shriner. And the Shriners are only in the United States you have to be a 33rd degree Mason. So that means all Shriners have done all these oaths to bad things. 
and given their lives over, which is not good to the enemy. Um, there's also the Order of Eastern Star, which is for women. It's a women's version of Freemasons. As there, there's the Order of De Malay, which is targeted to boys ages 12 to 21 to try to get them infiltrated as soon as possible. And there's also Job's Daughters. There's Rainbows for Girls ages 11 to 20. So um, those are the, and there's, there's like York Rite, there's Scottish Rite. Um, in 19, uh, well, yeah, 1959, there were 4 million Masons in the United States. Now we're down to about 2 million. So it's been cut in half, which is good. Uh, but what's interesting is when I'm driving around the United States and some in Canada, um, every town, every, not every town, but any town of significance, any city of significance has a Masonic Lodge. There's 26,500 Masonic Lodges uh, that are in the United States. So you can see them as you're entering town. They have their logos on the front posted there. You know, welcome to blank blank city. And then they of course have all these different lodges and things, Moose Lodge and um, Masons, and you'll see it. So anything that's a secret society is secret for a reason, because they're doing some things they shouldn't be doing. There's things called the Independent Order of Odd Fellows. There's the Order of Elks. There's Order of Skull and Bones. There's Ku Klux Klan, National Grange, Woodmen of the World, Knights of Pythias. So I'm going to describe, this is what he explains, David Barton, that originally Masons were the craftsmen who traveled across Europe in 938 AD building cathedrals, abbeys, churches, castles, and other stone buildings. That's what a mason really was. Obviously, I mean, if you think about the, the term mason and don't associate it with the group, then that's what a mason is. They're supposed to build things with stone and concrete and things like that, bricks. Uh, they traveled to Europe and did stone cutting and laying and were members of masons lodged. Traveling Masons were called Freemasons, as they were free to travel the land and do their trade. The non-traveling Masons belonged to local Masonic guilds and were often employed by the Free Masons. In the early 1700s, Masons were on the decline as carpentry became more prevalent, so they started building more with wood than they did with stone made houses and so forth out of wood and so forth. So in 1703, they opened up the Masons up to various professions other than stone cutters. The new accepted members included aristocrats and members of royal families. You know, you think about the Rothschild uh, family. The Rothschilds were into banking over like in England and they got into this whole Freemasons group to help control and to help have money flowing in and to control other, you know, countries essentially with banking. You know, whenever there were wars going and breaking out and so forth, they would take advantage of like the rebuilding through loans and so forth. So, um, so it says, uh, the new accepted members included aristocrats and members of royal families, then politicians and prominent individuals who wanted to rub shoulders with royalty and other important people also would join. So in 1717 in London, there were four separate London lodges of accepted speculative masons that joined together. And they established the first grand lodge and elected grand master over the new form of masonry. As speculative masonry was established, they claimed that God had given Adam certain secrets. I'm like, really? Related to masonry and that Adam transmitted these secrets to his sons, and from that generation to the next, down through the history of the Bible, and finally on to modern Masons, that those who had been involved in any type of construction in the Bible, Noah and the Ark, Solomon with the temple, Nehemiah with the wall, had been actually master Masons, and knew the secrecy of Masonry. Bah! Wrong. By 1730, there were 100 speculative lodges in England. 
from speculative masonry sprang up several different paths or branches of masonry that eventually became established as today's Freemasonry. So now let's transfer it now to America. And this is what he talks about, um, the understanding of American Freemasons. Is they say that Jesus of Nazareth was but a man like us or his history, but the unreal revival of an older legend. The true Mason, they say, realizes with the divine illumination of his lodge that as a Mason, his religion must be universal. So they say that Christ, Buddha, or Muhammad, the name means little, for he recognizes only the light and not the bearer. They worship at every shrine, bow before every altar, whether in temple, mosque, or cathedral. They say the good is never separated from the evil. The two must commingle, that all go well. This is called the doctrine of dualism, present in the religions of the Medes and Persians, as well as in Zoroastrianism and Gnosticism, ancient religions of which Masonry claims to be the modern receiver. So they go on. This is, the, again, what the American Freemasons believe. The absolute is reason. If God is, he is by reason. Masonry recognizes deity and proceeds only after asking divine guidance, but it does not specify any particular deity. You can worship any god you please and be a Mason. So that's not right. Bah, wrong. Um, what's interesting is in 1825, the U.S. Attorney General, his name was William Wirt, he got into becoming a Mason. But then as he was in it over time, he began to understand it's evil, not good. So he publicly came out against it. Others that came out against it and denounced it were the Reverend Charles Finney. He used to be a Mason, if you didn't know that. And then he got out of it um, and denounced it. The Reverend D.L. Moody was against it. Reverend Jonathan Blanchard of Wheaton College was against it. So when they started coming out against it, then the numbers started falling back. The lodges in the, in the state of New York dropped from 480 lodges to 49. So it's about a, what, a 90% decline. The number of lodges in the state of Maine went from 24 down to one. So they knew, the, the, the Masons, they had to change some things. They had to make themselves look better. And so they did. They, uh, um, it, it was in 1835, they um, started focusing on more philanthropic things, trying to make themselves look better to people in the mainstream. And the number of lodges increased in New York from 49 to 172. Um, it went from 1835 to 1850. And then in 1860, they had back up to 432. So unfortunately though, the new leadership of Masons were anti-Christian and pagan. The fathers of modern American Freemasonry were Albert Mackey and Albert Pike. Masons who were presidents included Teddy Roosevelt, William Howard Taft, Warren Harding, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Lyndon Johnson, and Gerald Ford. Now I'm going to read, um, actually, I just read this um, this morning about George Washington. Because a lot of people think that, oh, he had to have been, you know, a really bad... Uh, Freemason. And it's really interesting to read about George. Uh, I had it here. And I will find it here shortly. Okay. Here we go. George Washington, undoubtedly the most recognizable founding father associated with Masonry, told the Reverend Snyder that he wanted to correct an error you have run into of my presiding over the English lodges in this country. The fact is I preside over none, nor have I been in one more than once or twice within the last 30 years. And this statement by Washington, is this statement by Washington accurate? Was he really an active or an inactive 
nominal Mason. The validity of George Washington's claim is confirmed by an investigation of his Masonic activities. William Adrian Brown, former librarian of the George Washington Masonic Memorial in Alexandria, Virginia, compiled a chron chronological list of George Washington's life activities in his book, When and Where, A Chronology of the Life of George Washington. Among Washington's many activities, Brown identifies 29 Masonic activities involving Washington during his 47 years of being a Freemason. Significantly, many of the Masonic activities and contacts in that list were neither initiated by nor participated in by Washington, and several others hardly represent actual Masonic business. For example, included among the 29 are occasions when memorabilia was sent to Washington by other Freemasons, as well as when greetings were extended to him by groups of Masons. Significantly, Washington was given scores of gifts by grateful admirers. Some gifts were from Masons. Similarly, Washington was greeted by hundreds of different groups. Some were Masonic. Yes, it would be unreasonable to select those specific occasions from among hundreds and classify them as genuine Masonic activities. Also among the events linked to Masonry were public events where Washington was present and at which some Masons were in attendance among the crowd such as Washington's inauguration and public parades. Moreover, included among the Masonic activities linked to Washington were Masonic events at which Washington was not even present, such as on four occasions when various lodges, often from other states, recommended him as Grand Master, a position he declined in each case, or named him an honorary member of their lodge. The genuine Masonic activities in which Washington participated were very few. They include Washington's first becoming a Mason at the age of 20, November 4, 1752, followed by two more Masonic meetings over the next 10 months, on March 3rd and August 4th, 1753, in which he completed the three steps of early American Freemasonry. The higher degrees, so common today, were rare then. Interestingly, some American Masons condemned higher degrees as being representative of European Freemasonry. Washington took no higher degrees. The young Washington attended two more lodge meetings on September 1st, 1753 and January 4th, 1755. His next Masonic activity recorded by Brown did not occur until 23 years later in the American Revolution when on December 28th, 1778, he was part of a Masonic parade that marched to Christ Church in Philadelphia to attend divine service. During the revolution, Washington took part in six other Masonic activities or parades. Following the revolution, Washington attended a lodge meeting on June 24, 1784, and then on February 12, 1785, he attended the funeral of a fellow Mason. Washington attended no Masonic activities after April 7, April, April, April 1789. Um, therefore, in 47 years of being a Freemason, Washington, based on the documentation from Masonic authority, William Adrian Brown, participated actively in only 14 genuinely Masonic meetings or activities. Therefore, confirming his statement to Reverend Snyder that the fact is I preside over none of the lodges, nor have I been in one more than once or twice within the last 30 years. So Washington simply was not an active Freemason, nor were many other of the Masonic Founding Fathers. This information is puzzling to many Americans who have long believed that Washington was an active Mason. The misrepresentation of Washington is aggravated by the numerous paintings depicted him dressed in Masonic regalia, such as those showing him laying the cornerstone of the Capitol. In fact, one can enter the Masonic House of the Temple in Washington, D.C. and see a beautiful painting of George Washington in full Masonic dress, laying the Capitol cornerstone, reinforcing what is already wrongly believed about Washington the Mason. This painting, which appears on the cover of this book, right there, dun, 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 and so many others like it, is a modern creation done in 1993 two centuries after the event. Um, so essentially, uh, the truth is, it says that Washington's role in Freemasonry is emphasized far beyond what is justified by the facts. Modern Freemasonry claims more of Washington than is actually warranted. 
Washington's Masonic activity was and still is grossly exaggerated. He never sat for any Masonic portrait, and his portraits in effusive Masonic regalia are demonstrably spurious. So, then why do so many exist? As one art historian explains, those numerous Washington the Mason portraits are used by the Order of Masons to capitalize on what was only a nominal membership. So, he was not an active member of the Masons, even though a lot of them, you know, they, they, they were a part of that. Um, uh, let me see. Da, 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 da. I'm going to go into some more details, too. Um, so, Masons who were presidents were Teddy Roosevelt, William Harvard Taft, Warren Harding, Franklin Roosevelt, Harry Truman, Lyndon Johnson. Remember, Lyndon Johnson actually came out with a 501c3 to try to muzzle the pastors from coming against the evilness of those that were op operating in the, um, you know, that were trying to come against him. Um, he was a Mason. It wasn't good. Um, Gerald Ford actually was a Mason. Supreme Court justices, there were like 21 in the United States. Thurgood Marshall was a Freemason. Senators that were Freemasons included Robert Byrd, Everett Dirksen, Sam Urban, John Glenn, Jesse Helms, and Trent Lott. And there were many governors and U.S. representatives. So again, they tried to make themselves look philanthropic, working with crippled children, burn centers, you know, there's cancer centers. Um, although I have learned, um, in fact, there was a woman who had fourth stage lung cancer who wanted me to pray for her. This was a couple of years ago. She watched, I was on a TV interview on a little C broadcasting, Lester Sermons Network, and she was in Minnesota and she said, hey, can you pray for my sister? She's got fourth stage lung cancer. So I started to talk to the sister and before I prayed, the Lord showed me that she had a grandfather that was involved in Freemasons. And of course, because of the oaths that they make that are evil, I'm gonna go through some of that so you can understand it better, that can open the door up and does open the door up for the enemy to come down and affect the person, but also their ancestors because they make these oaths and curses that come down the bloodline and they affect you and me, even though maybe we were innocent and we didn't do anything. Um, so anyway, this cancer center that she was in, that she had cancer, um, I explained to her, about Freemasons and so forth. And the Lord kind of showed me that she had a grandfather that's involved in Freemasons. So I asked her, perchance, do you have a grandfather involved in Freemasons? And she said, yes, yes, I do. And I'm like, oh. And then I explained to her all the bad things that could happen. And she's like, oh my gosh, now that you mention it, I had a dream the other night. And in the dream was Jesus and my grandfather. And Jesus told me the reason I had cancer was because of my grandfather. And I'm like, yeah, no kidding. I go, he made some pretty bad oaths if he stayed in the Mason's very long, you know, he, he cursed himself and his bloodline, essentially. He's selling himself for money. That's why they do it, is for finances and to be set for life money-wise. But it's, you're selling your soul to the devil, essentially. It's evil. And she's like, oh my gosh, everybody in my family has cancer. And I'm like, well, that explains a lot, doesn't it? And she's like, yes, yes, it does. So um, I'll go on here. The Roman Catholic Cardinal Bernard Law in 1996 sent a letter to the bishops in the United States saying that Freemasonry was incompatible with Catholicism. The denominations that are pro-Freemasons include Baptists, Methodists, Presbyterians, and Episcopalians. Um, in fact, I've been told that that a lot of these Freemasons can do their activities inside of like Baptist churches, or they may even have their logo there. And I'm like, oh my gosh. So that explains a lot of why there's such religiousness and, uh, and uh, no free, uh, no free freedom, you know, truly. You know, I'm not saying that every Baptist, Methodist, Presbyterian, Episcopalian you know, supports Freemasonry, but obviously if their denomination does, then that's not good. Denominations that are against Freemasons, that are saying they're bad, include the Assembly of God, Westlands, the Salvation Army, Seventh-day Adventists, Church of the Nazarene, Christian Reformed, Lutherans, Church of the Brethren, and the Eastern Orthodox. Um, so, in the book, 
by David Barton. He said the overwhelming majority of the U.S. founders were not active Freemasons or they weren't even Freemasons. Um, you know, those that were Freemasons were largely inactive. So the overwhelming majority of both Masonic and non-Masonic founders of America were generally Orthodox Christians who were very pro-God and pro-Christ in both their words and their actions. So that's good to know. But the Masons try to get people to believe that, oh no, all the American founding fathers were full-blown loving Masons. So that's, again, David Barton. Um, and I'm gonna share a link on breaking off the Freemason curses. I actually went through this uh, with my friend Dawn and her husband Paul this weekend, and I yawned. I'm like, well, that's a good sign. You know, and it was pretty thorough. I mean, it's probably, I mean, it took, if I were to read it by myself, I could probably do it in 20 minutes. Um, but it's very, very thorough. It breaks off the specific degrees that are the most significant of the curses that come down the bloodline. And I'll read a little bit of that to you at the end so that you can see that. I'm gonna post that so you can go through this yourself whenever you want. Um, and that, and this article actually that, that breaks it all off is was, uh, I believe it was uh, Reverend Charles Fitty that put that together. So um, he used to be a Mason. He, he realized after he'd been in it for, I don't know how many years, that it was bad, so he came out of it. All right, now I'm gonna read and switch to this. Um, it's called jesusissavior.com. Jesus-is-savior.com. Talks about the uh, Freemasonry and the organization within an organization. This is really interesting to note. It says, deception is their game and infiltration is their aim. The original article has here is on cuttingedge.org um, with added information by David Stewart. So the purpose of Freemasonry is to lure good people down an evil road. Little by little, Freemasonry tries to corrupt good Christian men. The group's nature is highly deceptive. Lower level Freemasons, so if you're just starting out getting into Freemasons, are kept in the dark deliberately, lest they resign immediately. Because if they knew, you know, if you knew an organization was evil, if you had to pledge your life to Satan on the very first day, you wouldn't do it. It does it gradually. That's how Satan works, obviously. It says the group wants to maintain a good public image by retaining members from the best of men. But these men are not told the true satanic nature of the innermost esoteric group. Whereas talented and famous men feel honored to belong to such a prestigious group, it's all designed to deceive them into following Satan. Uh, it's really sad and tragic. Most men shirk off allegations, laugh, and simply won't investigate the matter. They are pulling on the same rope as the devil and don't care enough to find out what they're a part of. And God will hold those men accountable. Um, but let's see. Da, 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 da. It says, no one would join the cult if they knew the true agenda of Freemasonry, that is, to usher in the Antichrist system here on earth. The lowest three degrees of Freemasonry are highly deceived, deliberately kept in the dark. The public is accustomed to it, expects little from it, and therefore takes little notice of it. It says, back during the time of the founding of America, Adam Weishaupt, W-E-I-S-H-A-U-P-T, felt that Freemasonry was the easiest way to get a good Christian man onto a path to destruction. The occult knows how to corrupt people. They go from Christianity to denying, to atheism, to Satanism. They choose hell, ultimately, in the end. A large percentage of our founding fathers were Freemasons, but they were not evil men, and they were not active in it. You know, they were part of an evil system, but they didn't fully comprehend that. Weishaupt didn't have to corrupt Freemasonry. Freemasonry was a corrupt skateboard ready-made for his purposes. But Weishaupt got caught. It's a sleigh ride into hell. Formalism perfected the corruption process over several hundred years. Freemasonry is based upon the ancient mystery religions of Egypt and Babylon. The all-seeing eye is sometimes considered the eye of God, with a little g, that is Lucifer. 
Freemasons recognize Satan as a Christian belief. They consider Lucifer as the good guy. Freemasonry is a fraternity within a fraternity. Masons make blood oaths. As you go up in the organization, the oaths become worse, killing each other and worse. Freemasons are offered financial fortunes guaranteed for the rest of their life. Um, and then he also refers here to Megiddo, the March to Armageddon, a two hour, 16 minute uh, documentary. It says, let us hear a Masonic author Manley P. Hall described this two-dimensional organization of Freemasonry. Masonry is comprised of two distinctly different organizations, one visible and one invisible. Hall describes his two-level organization. Hall was honored by the Scottish Rite Journal, who called him the illustrious Manley P. Hall in September of 1990, and further called him Masonry's greatest philosopher saying the world is a far better place because of Manly Palmer Hall, and we are better persons for having known him and his work. This is what Manly P. Hall said. Freemasonry is a fraternity within a fraternity, an outer organization concealing an inner brotherhood of the elect. It is necessary to establish the existence of these two separate and yet interdependent orders, the one visible and the other invisible. The Visible Society is a splendid camaraderie of free and accepted men enjoined to devote themselves to ethical, educational, fraternal, patriotic, and humanitarian concerns. But the Invisible Society is a secret, and most, uh, this is August, defined as of majestic dignity, grandeur, fraternity, whose members are dedicated to the service of a mysterious, Arcanum Arcandrum, defined as a secret, a mystery. Then he goes on to say, Albert Mackey, 33rd degree Mason and author of the informative Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, 1873, confirms Hall's revelation. Visible Masonry, in a circular published March 18, 1775, by the Grand Orient of France, reference is made to two divisions of the order, namely visible, and invisible masonry. By invisible masonry, they denoted that body of intelligent and virtuous masons who, irrespective of any connection with dogmatic authorities, constituted a mysterious and invisible society of the true sons of light, who scattered over the two hemispheres, were engaged with one heart and soul in doing everything for the glory of the great architect. Of course, the great architect is Satan. It's not God and for the good of their fellow men. In other words, the members of the invisible masonry are the true leaders who cooperate on a global scale for the great architect to achieve the great work, which is the new world order. Ah, where have we heard that before? What then is the purpose of the visible lodge? By visible masonry, they meant the congregation of masons into the lodges which were often affected by the contagious vices of the age in which they lived. The former is perfect. The latter continually needs purification. Albert Mackey, 33rd degree, Encyclopedia of Freemasonry, 1873, page 829. In other words, Masons of the Invisible Lodge are the truly perfected men, while the poor, regular Masons of the Visible Lodge are afflicted with the contagious vices of the age in which they lived. Mackey holds Masons of the Visible Lodge in very, very low esteem. And notice that masonry has divided itself into these two lodges a very long time ago, in 1775. Masonry has almost always been this way. So many well-meaning men are members of the visible society with no knowledge whatsoever of the inner visible society, which is the evil of evils. It says, in fact, Albert Pike had some things to say about the brethren in the visible society. Masonry, like all the religions, all the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy, conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages, or the elect, and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth which it calls light and draw them away from it. 
Did you hear these keywords from Pike? Masonry is a religion, after all, after the order of the Satanic Mysteries, the equally Satanic Hermetic Philosophy and Alchemy. Masonry conceals its secrets from the brethren in the outer visible society, no matter their rank. Only the elect in the inner visible society ever know the truth. The poor brethren in the visible society are spoon-fed false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols. For what reason? Those poor guys in the visible society deserve only to be misled. If a man were known to revere Jesus Christ in the beginning of his membership within Masonry, he would be immediately shunted into the visible society and would never ever learn the truth. He would never ever be considered an adept or a sage or one of the elect, for those terms are reserved for the members of the invisible society. You would be one of those who were deliberately lied to about the doctrines of masonry and given deliberate misinterpretations of its symbols so that you would merely think that you knew the truth. Pike then completes his instructions to intentionally mislead those members of the visible society by saying, so masonry jealously conceals its secrets and intentionally leads conceited interpreters astray. Conceited means pride, prideful. And again, what I've put in my book, Restore Your Freedom, is the spirit of Leviathan. Pride is very strong on people that get into Freemasons because they're, you know, the whole premise is that we know something secret that you guys don't know. So therefore we're better than you. And that's why a lot of people suffer from back pain, neck pain. You know, I've seen a lot of people struggle with cancer because of these curses that people that are in Masons have no clue that are in the, the visible society of it. All right, let me go on. Members of the visible society are referred to as the masses. And you do comprise 95% of all Masons. Listen to what Pike says about telling the truth of the organization to the masses. A spirit, he said, that loves wisdom and contemplates the truth close at hand is forced to disguise it, to induce the multitudes, that is you, to accept it. Fictions are necessary to the people, and the truth becomes deadly to those who are not strong enough to contemplate it in all its brilliance. If a person is not capable of accepting the truth, that inner core, invisible Freemasonry really worships and serves Satan, then such truth would become deadly to you. Therefore, fictions are necessary. So visible Masons would not be so devastated that they would leave Freemasonry and expose its inner secrets. A very recent book also speaks of these two organizations. David Ovason, a noted astrologer, has written a book published in 1999 entitled The Secret Architecture of Our Nation's Capital, The Masons and the Building of Washington, D.C. It says this book is not an anti-Mason book. In fact, it glowing forward to this book is written by none other than C. Fred Kleinknecht, 33rd degree, Sovereign Grand Commander, the Supreme Council. In other words, the conclusions of this book are highly thought of by one of the most important current Masons in the world today. Listen to what this book says about the two organizations of Freemasonry. After speaking of the cosmic astral journey in Masonic terms, Ovasin speaks of the meaning of the more common symbols of Masonry. Bromwell injected a profound level of esotericism into the bland seeming symbols used within the lodges. These proliferate on the so-called tracing boards and carpets used by master Masons to demonstrate Masonic symbols to the neophytes. When not used as an instrument of education, the tracing boards and carpets remain as symbols of the lodge, of the inner and outer way of the craft. So David Ovasin admits that masonry has both an inner, invisible, and an outer, visible, society. And Albert Pike has boldly stated that the neophytes are deliberately taught untruths about the meaning of the symbols. New Age author Bill Cooper has this to say about these two fraternities, one within the other. Most members of the Freemasons are not aware that the Illuminati practices what is known as secrets within secrets or organizations within organizations. The final example of this fraternity within a fraternity, the invisible residing within the visible, comes from the oldest New World Order planning document known to be in existence. This document is one of the best examples of automatic writing 
and it details many of the changes societies throughout the world must make in order to achieve the kingdom of the Christ. This document is known as the Protocols of the Learned Elders of Zion and is being followed carefully today. Listen as the supernatural author speaks of the two organizations within Freemasonry. The author is speaking of the guise by which the Illuminati will ultimately seize dict dictatorial control. It says, for what purpose then have we invented this whole policy and insinuated it into the minds of the Gentiles without giving them any chance to examine its underlying meaning? For what, indeed, if not in order to obtain in a roundabout way what is for our scattered tribe unattainable by the direct road? It is this which has served as the basis for our organization of secret masonry, which is not known to and aims which are not even so much as suspected by these Gentile cattle, attracted by us into the show army of Masonic lodges in order to throw dust in the eyes of their fellows. Notice the supernatural author described the Freemasons of the outer, visible fraternity as Gentile cattle, which had been deliberately drawn into the fraternity for show, so as to throw dust in the eyes of their fellows. It turns out that the Masons of the Invisible Fraternity think quite lowly of the Masons of the Visible Fraternity. But why should we be surprised? For Albert Pike called the Visible Brethren who are just trying to learn what the symbols of the Lodge mean, conceited interpreters. Uh, I'm gonna skip some of this, let me see. When a Mason learns the key to the warrior on the block is the proper application of the dynamo of living power, he has learned the mystery of his craft. The seething energies of Lucifer are in his hands, and before he may step onward and upward, he must prove his ability to properly apply energy. This is in the Lost Keys to Freemasonry, Manly P. Hall. It says, the Scottish Rite Journal praised Manly Hall in 1990 as Masonry's greatest philosopher. One 32nd degree Mason wrote back to me, stating that he had never ever heard of Manly P. Hall, yet you can see his book was published by the McCoy Publishing and Masonic Supply Company. The only reason this high-ranking Mason had never heard of Manly P. Hall is that Hall was a leader of the Invisible Fraternity, while this Mason was participating in the Visible Fraternity. So how interesting is that? They keep people in the, in the dark, you know, because they knew that if they actually got them into what they were really about, they would uh, turn against it. They wouldn't be a part of that. Um, let's see. Another 33rd degree Freemason, Foster Bailey, sponsored his wife, Alice Bailey, into co-masonry, where she became a key leader. Alice was also the top leader of the House of Theosophy from the 1920s to the early 1950s. She was a prolific writer, admittedly a channeler for a spirit by the name of Master D.K. She had significant revelations to add to this subject of inner, invisible Freemasonry. There is no disassociation between the one universal church the sacred inner lodge of all true Masons and the innermost circles of the esoteric societies, she wrote in a thing called Externalization of the Hierarchy. Bailey is saying here that once you get into the inner, invisible part of Freemasonry, there is no distinction possible, no distinction possible between this part of Masonry, the true universal church, which we know to be the church of the Antichrist, and of the similar, similar innermost circles of the other secret societies throughout the world. But then Bailey makes an even stronger statement, revealing the inner invisible Masonic fraternity. The Masonic movement is the custodian of the law. It is the home of the mysteries and the seat of initiation. It holds in its symbolism the ritual of deity and the way of salvation is pictorially, pictorially preserved in its work. The methods of deity are demonstrated in its temples and under the all-seeing eye, the work can go forward. It is a far more occult organization that can be realized, and it is intended to be the training school for the coming advanced occultists. Since the meaning of the word occult is hidden or invisible, we know that Bailey is here speaking of the inner invisible part of Freemasonry. And not only is this invisible fraternity exist, it is intended to be the training ground for the coming advanced occultists. So, it basically says Freemasons are suckers. Albert Pike, 1809 to 1891, the most infamous
figure in Freemasonry, founder of the evil Ku Klux Klan. So again, Albert Pike started the KKK and the father of modern day Freemasonry degraded lower level Masons saying that they deserve only to be misled. Masonry, like all the religions, all the mysteries, hermeticism and alchemy conceals its secrets from all except the adepts and sages or the elect and uses false explanations and misinterpretations of its symbols to mislead those who deserve only to be misled, to conceal the truth which it calls light from them and to draw them away from it. So many men today consider it prestigious to be a member of Freemasonry, but Albert Pike, just as Satan does, in simplest terms, called them stupid ignoramuses for being dumb enough to be deceived. Pike said that they get what they deserve for being stupid. How, that, how does that feel if you're a Freemason? You couldn't pay me to be a Freemason. They're all a bunch of suckers, being reeled in by the devil, doing the devil's bidding, helping to build the new world order in woeful ignorance. It says most Freemasons are porch Masons, that is, they are outsiders from the inside group. Mormonism operates the exact same way, with 95% of Mormons being used as a religious cover for the child molesting 5% in the innermost circle. Remember, I learned about that when I was over in Idaho Falls, that uh, there was there's a strong Mormon uh, temple that's there, actually on the river, the Snake River, that I saw. And, um, and, 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 the, and the leaders there were all corrupt. They were having sex with children, you know. And then I learned more about Mormonism, how those that are in the inner circle will essentially take the clothes off of girls and boys when they're like, I don't know, 12 or 13 and no longer have them be a, a virgin. You know, it's, it's evil. It's evil and wicked and, and horrible in all ways. So, um, anyways. It says, not only that, read what Pike said concerning Freemasons and the truth to draw them away from it. Um, and then this Helena Petrovna Blavatsky, she founded the Theosophical Society. Helena founded the, uh, it in 1875. Her most popular work was a two volume book she wrote titled The Secret Doctrine, in which she woefully states, Lucifer represents life, thought, progress, civilization, liberty, independence. Lucifer is the Logos, the serpent, the savior. It's in pages 171, 225, and 255 in volume two. She says, it is Satan who is the God of our planet and the only God. And they have reference to several pages here. The celestial virgin, which thus becomes the mother of gods and devils at one and the same time, for she is the ever loving beneficent deity. But in antiquity and reality, Lucifer or Luciferius is the name. Lucifer is divine and terrestrial light, the Holy Ghost and Satan at one and at the same time. So she was a co-Freemason. Evil says, clearly Helena was a devout Satan worshiper and an enemy of the cross of Jesus Christ. She's also one of the pioneers of today's occult New Age movement. Uh, beginning in the early to mid 19th century, with the incorporation of Eastern mystical concepts into the existing traditions, the Western myst mystery tradition experienced a major divergence between the esoteric hermetic rites of the Masonic and Rosicrucian traditions and the Theophosical schools, with the major divergence occurring during the life of Madame Blavatsky that came to be grouped under the general rubric of New Age spirituality. So it says, Theosophy, Satan worship, New Age, Freemasonry, and witchcraft are inseparable. Theosophy and Freemasons are both of the devil. It is to no surprise that birds of a feather flock together. Satan's crowd is united together against the God of the Bible and Christianity. They all hate God, hate the word of God, and are committed to one world order, i.e. the beast system of the coming Antichrist. So we are to have nothing to do with Freemasons. Freemasons are deceived, you know, and I, I do, I know personally a guy from Indiana who was a 33rd degree Mason and became a Shriner and he came out of it, which is hard to do. Let me get a drink of water here. But he had a lot of physical pain throughout his body. I mean, major stuff and he's still dealing with it. I mean, he's been away from that stuff, I think at least 10 years now. 
So when we make oaths, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna read a little bit of, I'm gonna post this. In fact, I might be able to post it right now. Yes, I think I can. I will post it now, copy. I think I can go into this. And uh, then it will be on here. So anyway, I'm gonna have you guys, I would recommend to go through this. This is basically a renunciation pretty thorough renunciation of the uh, Freemason stuff. This is basically a renunciation. Oops, there we go. Here we go. Paste. Boom. All right, call it prayers to break off Freemasons. There we go. Um, so let me go to, this is by Charles Finney, who used to be a Freemason. And uh, it was compiled by Isaiah 54 Ministries, Isaiah54.org. So it says, Isaiah 54 Ministries is a ministry of reconciliation. Heeding the call of 2 Corinthians 5, 18, 19, we work towards reconciliation between man and God, between man and his fellow man through the Christian dis disciplines of worship, inner healing, and spiritual warfare. Um, Isaiah 54 Ministries has compiled this article to help Christians become free from the curses brought upon themselves and their bloodlines because of involvement with Freemasonry and other secret organizations. The first step towards freedom is to understand the reasons that curses transfer through a family line. Iniquity and idolatry bring generational curses. Freemasonry's practices and doctrines are iniquities laced with idolatry. We believe to facilitate healing more completely, the believer must, at the very least, understand this foundational concept. And that is true. You have to understand. You know, it's just like when people read the prayers that I have to break off Jezebel, Leviathan, Ahab, Legion, you have to know what you're doing. You can't just read them to read them. You have to have an understanding of that comprehension. So um, they are out of Middle Island, New York. And it goes on and says, it says, if you were once a Mason or a descendant of a Mason, we recommend that you pray through the following prayer from your heart. Don't be like the Masons who are given their obligations and oaths one line at a time and without prior knowledge of the requirements. See, that's what they do when they infiltrate these people in Freemason stuff is they'll give them like one line at a time and say, repeat after me. And they don't know what they're getting themselves into. You know, if they were to see the whole thing, all the degrees, they'd say, ah, oh, no, I'm not doing this. Um, so it says, please read through it. Uh, Please read it through first so you know what is involved. It is best to then pray this aloud. And again, you can pray it with somebody else present or just do it on your own. Um, it says, we suggest a brief pause following each paragraph. So uh, I'm not going to read the whole thing because it would take, uh, I mean, it takes about 20 minutes to read the whole thing. So I, I pasted that. But this is just an example to give you. Um, this is for the first degree. It says, I renounce the oaths taken and the curses involved in the first or entered apprentice degree, especially their effects on the throat and tongue. I renounce the hoodwink, the blindfold, and its effects on emotions and eyes, including all confusion, fear of the dark, fear of the light, fear of sudden noises. I renounce the secret word Boaz and all that it means. I renounce the mixing and mingling of truth and error and the blasphemy of this degree of masonry. I renounce the noose around the neck, the fear of choking, and also every spirit causing asthma, hay fever, emphysema, or any other breathing difficulty. I renounce the compass point, sword, or spear held against the breast, the fear of death by stabbing pain, and the fear of heart attack from this degree. In the name of Jesus Christ, I now pray for healing of the throat, vocal cords, nasal passages, sinus, bronchial tubes, and for healing of the speech area and the release of the word of God to me and through my family. And it goes on. It's got the second degree, third degree, holy royal arch degree, 18th degree, 30th degree, 31st degree, 32nd degree. You know, and some of these things are pretty evil. I'll read the 32nd degree renunciation. I'll renounce the oaths taken and the curses involved in the 30. Uh, second degree of masonry, the sublime prince of the royal secret. I renounce masonry's false trinitarian deity, Om, which is A-U-M, and its parts, Brahma, the creator, Vishnu, the preserver, and Shiva, the destroyer. I renounce the deity of Ahura, slash Mazda, the claimed spirit or, or source of all light, 
and the worship with fire, which are an abomination to God, and also the drinking from a human skull in many rites. So apparently they drink from human skulls. That is not cool. And it also has to break off the York Rite, Shriners, 33rd and Supreme Degree, and then all other degrees. And uh, in the all other degrees, it covers um, these other lodges and stuff. Prince Hall, Freemasonry, Mormonism, the Order of Amaranth, Odd Fellows, Buffaloes, Druids, Foresters, Orange. Orange? What is orange? Elks, Moose and Eagles, Lodges, the Ku Klux Klan, the Grange, the Woodmen of the World, Riders of the Red Robe, the Knights of Pythias, the Mystic Order of the Veiled Prophets of the Enchanted Realm. Where do they come up with these names? Uh, the Women's Orders of the Eastern Star, and of the White Shrine of Jerusalem, the Girls' Order of the Daughters of the Eastern Star, the International Orders of Job's Daughters, and of the Rainbows, the Boys' Order of Demolay, in their effect. So, anyway, it goes on to these all other degrees. It's pretty lengthy, that one. I can't read the whole thing because it would take longer than what you would have patience for. And I have read through, it's been an hour of this. So I'm hopeful that all of you that have listened understand that the uh, Freemasons are evil, that it's all about Satan, it's all about money, and that there is an inner group of people that know all the evilness of it, that they try to keep the other members blind from, so they don't know that. Just like the Mormon group, there's like 5% that are evil, evil, wicked. You know, and the other 95% are like lemmings that come into it. You know, lemmings, do you remember lemmings? I remember watching, actually, it was like, it was a comic book, I think it was, where these lemmings were let off, let off, like, uh, they were like inundated. I think it might have been Uncle Scrooge or something, but uh, anyway, they were like all over the country, wherever, or, or all over the, uh, yeah, the countryside. And these lemmings would go wherever this person led them, you know, even over a cliff. And so that's exactly what's going on here, is that the very core of these groups are very evil and very demonic. And what's interesting is if you have a person that you know that's in that, could be your father, could be your grandfather, could be your great-grandfather, and you may have no clue. I would go through this regardless if I were you. You know, I went through it myself. I yawned several times throughout it. You know, Don also had uh, some stuff, and Paul, so it's like good to do this uh, because you don't know what's in your background. I don't know. You know, a lot of us don't know anything past our grandparents because we're such a diverse society today. We don't spend much time with our great-grandparents. Oftentimes they die, you know, when we're little anyway. So we don't know what they all did, you know, and, but God does, so. Um, and it doesn't negate going through the prayers to break off Jezebel, Leviathan, Ahab, and Legion. You need to still do that as well um, and break off witchcraft curses. But this is very evil, very dark, and it's pledging basically, you know, the people that go through this pledging their lives. In fact, um, how does this, I'm going I'm to read some of this. Um, it says, all participants should now be invited to sincerely carry out the following. So, uh, talks about, uh, well, they have them blindfolded. They call it hoodwinked. Yeah, for a reason, they get hoodwinked. They're blinded and going through this stuff. Um, it talks about cutting off and removing the noose from your neck. You know, um, so they probably do that kind of stuff. They probably, have, I mean, you can imagine what they do if you don't have, if you can't see what they're doing, you know, to you. Um, not good, but this is pretty thorough. So anyway, that link is now on the website or on the Facebook, Isaiah54.org. Of course, if you're, um, yeah, if you're watching on YouTube later, it's Isaiah, I-S-A-I-A-H. 54.org. So just read through that and watch what happens. I mean, see how many times you yawn or burp and get freed and maybe get healed from things you couldn't get healed from before. You know, again, that's restored to freedom. That's what my ministry is all about is trying to find every way possible to get people set free. Again, you have to cooperate. You have to be willing to participate. We can't twist your arm and get delivered from Freemasons and uh, witchcraft and Jezebel, Leviathan, pride, arrogancy, um, unforgiveness. You have to be a willing participant. That's why some people don't get delivered. But I want to find everything possible for those that truly want to pursue complete freedom and deliverance. 
you know, and uh, I'm still getting, you know, new revelations, and the Lord wants us to be all set free. So, anyway, I've never done a teaching on all of this before. It needed to be done. The Lord had been uh, impressing upon me this past week, and um, let you know tomorrow I will most likely not be doing Facebook Live because I'll be traveling to Portland, and uh, I, uh, I don't know. I, I probably won't be doing it, put it that way. Um, and then I'm ministering this weekend in Portland, um, in Tigard, which is suburb west of Portland, um, Kathy Pelton's home. She's a prophet on the Elijah list. That's at 6 p.m. Saturday, May the 18th, and then the 19th, I'll be at Solid Rock Church. That is in Hillsboro, Oregon, which is west of Portland, so... Alrighty, I will let you guys go. Thank you for watching and be free, be free. It's kind of funny to call themselves free masons, but they're not free, they're like tormented masons. You know what, if they named it tormented masons, I bet a lot of people would not join. I, I make, uh, I, I, uh, I, I move to change the name from Freemason to tormented mason. Anyone wants to second it? <laughs> and then no one will join it. It'll be like, yes, we've got them freed, truly. <laughs> All right, see you guys later. Love you, bye.